This week's podcast is with the man, Louis Schwartzberg, director of Fantastic Fungi. Got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Is the most visually stunning documentary that I've ever seen and one of the best about mushrooms and psychedelics. We had such a good talk this week. You will enjoy it. Welcome to the Third Wave Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Austin, here to bring you cutting edge interviews with leading scientists, entrepreneurs, and medical professionals who are exploring how we can integrate psychedelics in an intentional and responsible way for both healing and transformation. It is my honor and privilege to bring you these episodes as you get deeper and deeper into why these medicines are so critical to the future of humanity. So let's go and let's see what we can explore and learn together in this incredibly important time. Listeners, welcome back to the Third Way Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Austin, and just finished up with another phenomenal podcast interview, this one with Louis Schwartzberg, director of Fantastic Fungi, who is just a total gangster. Um, Louis comes from two Jewish parents who survived the Holocaust, talked about in the very beginning of this podcast how he believes in resilience about overcoming the story of victimization and showing resilience to build and create something beautiful. And then we went on to have just a beautiful conversation about mushrooms and the mycelial network and the back to land movement that he was involved with in the late sixties and early seventies. You know, we talked about wonder and awe, which is actually the focus of a new podcast that Louis is launching uh, in the next, I think it just launched at the time that you'll hear this. And then most importantly, we talked about Fantastic Fungi, this phenomenal documentary that Louis um, produced and launched last year. It took him 10 years to produce this documentary, and the time-lapse photography is incredible. Louis is basically known as the time-lapse videographer, cinematography guy. He is phenomenally talented, has made a number of other short videos that are on Netflix about nature, did something with Disney about bees. And from my perspective, Fantastic Fungi is more or less a magnus opus of his. So if you haven't seen it yet, it is now on Apple TV. You can watch it in your own home. And regardless, I really think you'll love this podcast. Louis and I just drop into a a beautiful space. As he said, once we were off the air, this was like the college days again, where you'd go back in like a corner and hide out from everyone and fucking light up a joint And then just dive right into these intellectually orgasmic conversations. And that was the type of conversation that we had. It was intellectually orgasmic. So I'm feeling like y'all will enjoy this one. As always, without further ado, I bring you Louis Schwartzberg. What responsibility did you feel with, with creating Fantastic Fungi? Basically, as a storyteller and a filmmaker... When someone shares their story with you, it's a blessing and a curse <laughs> because now you have a responsibility to share that story. And um, so whether it's been stories like I did with, you know, America's Heart and Soul back in around 2000, I filmed like 300 hours, you know, 30 stories of remarkable but ordinary people across America that have passion for their life, that have overcome adversity, yet are still filled with gratitude. and. Um, those are stories that I think um, I I gravitate to because my parents were Holocaust survivors and I saw how they were able to have, you know, hope and gratitude in their lives. So I love the stories of people that are resilient, you know, that don't let anything kind of, you know, bring them down and become a victim of it. So when you hear these stories, you have a responsibility to, to share them. With Fantastic Fungi, what a great, great story of, Basically, you know, in a nutshell, the core story is you have this, you know, underground, you know, network, a shared economy, not based on greed for ecosystems to flourish. What a genius, not only idea, but the actual path that nature has laid under our feet for how we need to live our lives, you know, our culture, our our social lives, our, our politics, all of it. And it's all, you know, kind of blowing up right now, you know, with this, you know, period of things breaking down and and we need a breakthrough. But that pattern, that blueprint is right there in front of us. And so when you learn about that story, 
then you want to share it. And, and it goes to like, you know, we were talking about working and being an entrepreneur and responsibility. It's like you build a network and you find ways <clears throat> to get that message out there and to share the truth. Um, live your life with purpose. And, and then that's one of the ways you become happy. When I first heard about Fantastic Fungi, this was probably the end of 2019. I was speaking with two really close friends of mine and they were telling me about the film and like, you know, they had microdosed and gone to see it. They're like, Paul, you have to see this film. And these people are like phenomenal people, you know, like anything they would recommend, I would immediately go and do it. And they're like, we went and saw this. The cinematography is incredible. It's absolutely stunning. Took him 10 years to make it. I was like, 10 years. That's so long. And then kind of at the end of that, they threw in what I thought was the most interesting part of it all, which is your promotional strategy. And what they said was like, you essentially, you know, you could have sold it to Netflix or you could have like done it that way, but you wanted to do it through the sort of mycelial network. I'd love to hear about that part from you like did you feel pressure like tell us that story around promotion yeah. and getting the word out like why did you choose and why have you continued to choose promoting fantastic fungi in this way when i started this film you know it was almost 13 years ago i did sort of make a vow to myself that i wanted to be able to control it not because i'm a control freak but in the past when you make films that other people own whether it's you know the studios or net geo whatever it's like you know you lose the ability to have a voice and how it's distributed and how it's marketed. And then typically what happens is by the time the film is finished, which takes a year or a year or two, then maybe the guy that, you know, liked your project is gone. And then there's politics and all that other stuff. So I kind of always wanted to be in that position. Luckily I was able to finish the film and maintain control. But then when offers, come in like a streaming channel, then, you know, they want it to be only used for streaming. And the idea of creating events, being able to hold a space for conversation, being able to, you know, do charity events, all kinds of stuff that, you know, opportunities, well, then that becomes restricted when somebody else owns it. And so I didn't want to have my heart broken again. You know, I did a film Wings of Life for Disney Nature. It was all about saving the bees you know, the most critical environmental thing that's happening on our planet, and all of a sudden it gets blocked, and you go, WTF? You know, like, why is the universe doing that? And, Wait, it got blocked? Well, it, they didn't distribute it because it was a, a change in executive command, and they for two years they blocked releasing a Disney nature film. The guy didn't, you know, didn't want to uh, promote that label when they have Marvel, Star Wars, Pixar. So it's not like there's anything that is nefarious. It's sort of like, you know, you just fall off the radar and, and you're like going, wait a minute, man, this is the most important thing for our planet. And you lose the ability to take your baby and voice that story. So with this particular film, I didn't want to do that, but I was at a crossroads because in order to distribute anything yourself, it takes money. And um, it meant having to raise that money. And I was at Esalen at the 50th anniversary of the first psychedelic conference that occurred. Mm. It was the anniversary. And um, it was amazing to be there because there's part of that is in my movie. We have some old archival footage of all these guys coming together, like Charlie Grobe and, you know, Brother David. And, you know, to have this conversation about psychedelics. These were the elders you know, around 1970. And so they had a, like a session on media. They asked me to show the trailer. I show the trailer and people immediately go, when's it going to be on Netflix? When are we going to be able to see it? And I go, I don't know if I want to do that because, you know, I want to be able to bring this to the community. I want to hold the space, have people have conversation, grow that mycelial network, bring all these people together. Or if I do the other thing, I get a small chunk of change, which doesn't even cover my budget, really, and I lose control. And so right then and there, people started to volunteer. They raised their hands and said, I'll give you five grand. I'll give you 10 grand. I said, I needed like 150 to really launch your own movie. That's the minimum to be serious, you know, to compete with the hundred million, two hundred million dollar movies that are in the marketplace, right? So um, right then and there, 60 or 70,000 was committed. 
And then bingo, I went, the mushrooms were speaking to me. This is the way I got to go. Because I, it wasn't like a, a lot of money, but it was significant in, the, in that it was the DNA of where the psychedelic movement occurred. And then right after that, I was invited to show the film in Portland where they have an initiative to decriminalize psilocybin for medical use. And again, it was like one of these things where, oh, I don't know, you know, it's another fundraiser. I mean, I want to support that. I don't know if I want to fly up to Portland. You know, it's like, you know, this and that. And you figure you're going to just fly in and fly out. I fly in. I look at the marquee. It says, fantastic fungi. I fly in early, you know, Sunday morning from L.A. And it's sold out. <laughs> and that, and all they did was, you know, put it up on Facebook. So through the mycelial network, boom, the thing just sold out. And for a filmmaker, that's really a rare experience. And I saw the energy in the audience. So you have people showing up that are foragers, psychonauts, scientists, teachers, healers, environmentalists, all connecting, actually even bef before the movie, in the lobby. They all know each other. Or they kind of know each other, right? The, the mycelial network is like, you know, making these connections and bonds. And I see people, you know, hugging, which I wish we could do now. <laughs> yeah. And uh, feeling the love, right? Young people, older people, all kinds of people, you know, diverse people. And then we do the movie and then I do a Q&A. And then during the Q&A, we invite local leaders that are either involved in, in the movement to decriminalize psychedelics or, uh, you know, foragers talking about mycology or chefs or local environmental leaders to talk about how to save the bees, which is all part of it. And that invigorates the local community to keep doing the good work that needs to get done. And that really warmed my heart. It told me that I was on the right path. And it's turned out to be, knock on wood, good, because through the mycelial network, we sold out well over 500, you know, screenings. Uh, before COVID, we grossed 2.2 million. We got a hundred percent, you know, score on Rotten Tomatoes. I had shown the film to distributors, even the quote unquote art house distributors. None of them wanted it, you know. So I knew there was an audience out there, just as you know, there's an audience out there, and um, it was important to uh, to launch it and to really, I think, catalyze a movement, a movement, an underground movement that is we both know is growing and how fast and how big, not sure, but we know it exists and we know what we want to be a part of it. And we know we want it to grow. Because it is so healing. And, and, you know, these mushrooms have this, this innate intelligence. There's a beautiful symbiosis with mushrooms and the earth. And that to me, it's sort of like, you know, with fantastic fungi and, I'm, I'm just going to assume that anyone who's listening to this has at least seen it or at least heard about it. If you haven't seen it yet, obviously, you know, go see it immediately. I think by the time this podcast will be published, yeah. it's now up on Apple TV. So if you haven't seen it yet, you can see it on Apple TV. But I think that was something that was so beautiful. You know, like on our podcast, we often talk about psychedelics in particular. But within Fantastic Fungi, it was sort of broken up into three sections. It was, you know, you, you went into the psychedelic research that's going on at places like Johns Hopkins and how psilocybin is being used to treat end-of-life anxiety. But I think there were a ton of fascinating little tidbits with, particularly like with the segments that you had Paul Stamets on about mm -hmm. mushrooms that were used to treat, you know, his, his mother's cancer. I think he talked about turkey tail right. and how that was so useful about, you know, mushrooms that could be used to soak up toxins mm -hmm. like oil uh, in the Amazon. To help with that. So I think to me, it's like we're seeing this growth of interest in mushrooms, both non psychoactive and obviously psychoactive mushrooms. And they seem to, you know, because mushrooms are really our oldest ancestors, you know, we go back billions right. of years yeah. um, when we first split off as one. And there's so, so much that we still have to learn from mushrooms. And if humanity happens to go extinct, the mushrooms will still be around yep. and maybe another billion years down the road, yeah. intelligence will flourish, you know, in some other way or form or whatever. Yeah. What's really fascinating, I mean, the mushrooms are like the fruit of the organism, the organism being this mycelium network 
And a lot of people don't know that. I didn't probably know that when I started the movie either. So, but what's interesting about that, and I think how it relates to the, like the work that you guys are doing, it's a different way of looking at what is the definition of life. I mean, the mycelium network is, is a conscious network of all these cells without a central brain. It's sentient, right? It is aware. It, um, it engages with its environment by always having to evolve and create new enzymes in order to devour the thing that's like on the, on, on the outside. But they're genius at really connecting, you know, trees to one another <clears throat> and plants to one another to share nutrients, to be an electrical grid, a warning system. And it's more powerful than this idea of the, of like the internet. People describe it as an underground internet under the ground. That's a major, um, you know, cool idea. It's beyond that because the internet is like this, you know, um, highway, right? Super highway where we use it to transfer information. But they're basically living agents that are navigating this underground network and figuring out who to connect with whom, right? And that is even more amazing. And so if you kind of zoom out and look at that and you go, well, wow, perhaps that's the way we ought to be living our lives, you know? This idea of the connections you make, the relationships you make, the idea that cooperation is maybe the most important thing, relationships, symbiosis, regeneration, rebirth. This is what life is, as opposed to the capitalistic kind of, you know, predator versus prey story, which we've been fed for the past 30, 40, 50 years. The macho story of, you know, kill or be killed, survival of the fittest. We got to let go of that story because that's the story that's driving us off a cliff. But the mycelial network, when you look at that story, that is the other side of the story that Darwin was trying to say. As a matter of fact, it was the majority of what Darwin was saying. They lifted out that phrase, survival of the fittest, Teddy Roosevelt and people in the 30s to justify imperialism of us invading third world countries. So. Most of what Darwin wrote about was botany, it was about plants, and plants are all about symbiosis, right? So I just love the idea that this is baby, I mean, the mushrooms are telling us a, a, a grand story, and even beyond the wisdom you would get on a psychedelic journey, if you just look at it from a very biological, you know, ecological point of view, how they function, how they foster and make life flourish, which is the key to survival, which is why we're here, you know, that to me is the major breakthrough that, that I, I learned in making that movie. Well, it's like the, the story of separation versus the story of interconnectedness. Yeah. You exactly. know, there's, there's, there's a great philosopher who we had on the show before, Charles Eisenstein, who has written quite a bit about this. And yeah. He even brought this up in terms of, you know, the, the context of what's going on with the virus right now, right? There's, yep. you know, obviously, uh, you know, a big hope of the psychedelic renaissance, if you will, has been, oh, like medicalizing or legalizing or decriminalizing these substances. More people who use psychedelics will then recognize how interconnected we are to everything around us. And, you know, a lot of people said, well, maybe it just took a virus for us to wake up to that and for us to recognize that. And I think that's the true power of, of the mushroom. It's they, they live in that interconnectedness. They live in that symbiosis. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, you know, like we know a lot about the, the fruiting spores, if you will, the fruiting bodies, because those are the, the mushrooms that we see in the woods and in the forests. But what I think I learned so much in fantastic fungi was like all about the mycelial network. Right. And that that phrase has almost become synonymous now with the psychedelic renaissance, yeah. where this isn't necessarily about, okay, how can we, how can pharmaceutical corporations sort of co-opt all these medicines? But instead, what I love about the movements around decriminalization is let's keep this in the community, right? Let's keep the healing in the community. Let's keep the, the energy within the community. Let's really honor, you know, our ancestors and our lineage where this medicine comes from. 
so that we ensure that it remains grounded and remains from the earth and not from, you know, a laboratory or anything like that. Because, you know, we've been living in symbiosis, like we talked about earlier, with mushrooms forever. And it feels like there's there's a true soul calling to to stay in touch with that and to eat more mushrooms both non-psychoactive and psychoactive. I mean, yeah. it's like every week now, Louis, that I get a pitch deck in my, in my inbox about a new mushroom company yeah. <laughs> that's, that's sprouting up. And I think that that's such a powerful way to go, okay, maybe, maybe slowly but surely more and more people are figuring it out. And yeah. it's not necessarily going to be one of those things where it's the usual sort of capitalistic growth you know, like the hockey stick of growth. That's what we're trying to avoid. In fact, what we really want to do is see, you know, uh, a day over day, month over month, you know, year over year, just the mycelium that we're spreading more and more and more and more until these sort of fundamental truths of well-being and living just become part of human culture. And I think it's that that we want to see. We don't necessarily need a major revolution and overthrowing all the systems that we already have in place. We just need the mycelial network to permeate all the systems and turn it into that sense of symbiosis and, and interconnectedness. No, absolutely. No, I think it's it's so true. Uh, you know, the patterns in the mycelial network and they mirror the pattern that's in your brain, in your circulatory system, the nervous system, in um, you know outer space. It's everywhere. And I, that idea of networking. You know, people say, well, you know, it would, the film is so beautiful. Well. That was part of the secret sauce message of the movie. I mean, what is beauty? I mean, I'm showing you rhythms and patterns of nature that live inside of every cell of your body. You know, you're looking at a mirror and you're going, oh my God, I recognize this because it's, it's, it makes me feel good. It's truth. I mean, you don't teach anybody like <clears throat> how to recognize beauty. It's an emotion you feel. And I, I feel I triggered that emotion by making the invisible visible with the shots of time lapse and and slow mo and micro and macro and showing you those this there's a there's a universe out there just because we don't see it with the limitation of our human vision which is a narrow spectrum of of light we we there is so much energy out there that surrounds us and so much life that surrounds us and it's great that we can dive into that world I mean, to dive into the world of the mushroom, to dive into the world of a flower, a hummingbird, a redwood tree, they all have different metabolic rates. And I think that, you know, one of the gifts, obviously, of, of taking a, a journey with psilocybin is you understand the idea that it's all alive, that it's all interconnected, and you can see it and feel it. And once you see it and feel it, I think your life is forever changed. And I tried to do that again, like with the movie, for those that have never experienced anything like that before, to be able to, you know, broaden your horizon, change your perspective, um, re- look at life differently, look at the interconnection without even taking a psychedelic journey, right? Um, that is, and that's why, you know, I'm really thrilled, you know, that it's going to be on Apple TV next week because. I want to hit a wider audience. You know, you were saying, let's slowly grow this mycelium network. I completely agree. But I also think it's going to be easy as a bridge to get others to come on board, you know, to get the farmers on board and say, boy, if you if you nurture, you know, the mycelium and the fungal network in your, you know, in your on your farms, you're going to get a 20, 30 percent yield crop. You know, they're going to get it in the heartbeat. They just have never, I think, been exposed to it. They all They've been sold on using, you know, petro fertilizers, and that's been the way of life. That's the way it's been since the fifties or sixties, you know. And um, and when you learn, you know, the whole organic approach to farming, again, that's a spiritual path, right? Living it in harmony with nature is always going to be a spiritual path. It's like uh, biodynamic farming, I think, is the the technical term that they use for that now. Yeah. Like not only, you know, there's like organic and there's beyond organic. Right. And, um, and it's that sense of it's honoring the rhythm of nature. Yeah. And like honoring our intuition and just almost being not egoless. I don't, because I don't like, I, I know a lot of people go, you know, no ego whatsoever. I think ego just is, ego is part of our identity, but allowing that to drop away to step into like, oh, how do I just honor the rhythm of the place and the situation that I'm in? 
Yeah. And that's why you know, I'm launching this podcast called Wonder and Awe, because I think the scientists ask, how does it work? How do these plants do their thing? You know, photosynthesis and all this, you know, analysis. And then the artists go, why? <laughs> and I think the people that are doing what you're describing in this, you know, trying to be in flow with nature, trying to facilitate it, trying to really, you know, enhance it, not trying to change it, you know, and that's beautiful because that puts you in flow with life's energy. Wow. You know, and now we have these things called forest bathing and, and scientists discover that when you're in a garden, you get these molecules that trigger endorphins. And it's great that we can have this efficacy of scientific analysis that proves right. what we feel that indigenous people have known forever, you know. Right. But the point, I guess, between that art and science approach is that you, what you want to get to is to be in the moment, to experience the divine, to see it all as one. How you get there, there's a lot of ways to get there. Scientific mind or, or the more artistic mind or surfing a big wave, music, making love. There's a lot of ways to get there. I think that's one of the goals of life. You know, like art is the creativity and we need the art and we need the science. The sci science is the reason, right? And when those two come together, right, it's sort of like something that I've been really obsessed with or interested in lately is like the concept of paradox and how life exists between paradox. And oftentimes when we feel most in tune or in, in with kind of our own chi, the middle way, if you will, is when we integrate art and science, reason and creativity, you know, like being able to accept everything that is and understanding that they're really, for each one of us, there's only one path. And I think that energy of balance allows an opening of like wonder and awe, which is what I love so much about this new podcast that you're launching is, you know, when I first got into studying psychedelics, um, I read a few research papers by a guy named Kenneth Tupper. And Kenneth is up in uh, Vancouver. He was a faculty at UBC and has worked for the British Columbia government. And he published a research paper that showed how ayahuasca was linked to wonder and awe and basically explaining why it's so necessary as part of like our educational process. Because in the industrial era, we stripped out all the wonder and awe. Mm -hmm. Right, We've stripped out all the mystery and the reverence for the unknown because what is inherent to our industrial system is knowing everything. Right, mm -hmm. It's knowing the time that something will be delivered on. It's knowing how many products will be delivered. It's knowing how much money we'll get for it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the place that wonder and awe exists is in the unknown. It's in the ability to sit with the mystery as it unfolds you know, beyond us. And I think, Louis, more than anything, if I had to put sort of like an arc to your creative career, if you will, it's inspiring that oh, through nature, yeah. you know, and a love for nature and a love for beauty. I love unveiling the mystery. You know, they, they asked Einstein, you know, his definition of God, and he said it was a sense of wonder. And he also said, I think that those who can't, you know, feel wonder and awe, their eyes are closed, they might as well be dead. <laughs> um, but I love peeling back the onion because the thing about nature is it has layers and layers and layers. It's not like you ever get there. Just like the cliche about, you know, your life is a journey. It's not about, you know, scoring a touchdown. It's the, it's the journey. And when you get there, that's not like the goal because there's always going to be like, you know, another layer, another door, another awakening that is around the corner. I just love the fact that the deeper I dive into it, the more I don't know. And the more that generates curiosity, the more it, you know, fires up the imagination. And then you figure that out or you do a story about that part. And then you go like, what's below that? <laughs> and what's below that? And what's below that? So I look at even my film career, you know, I start shooting time-lapse flowers because I can't afford to shoot movie film back in 1970. Um, you know, $100 a minute and 35 millimeter. I invent cameras that can shoot time lapse in 35 millimeter. I fall in love with flowers. The flowers seduced me with their color, taste, touch, aroma. 
And then you hear about the fact that the bees are disappearing, and you can't tell that story without telling the story of how bees co-evolved with flowers over 50 million years ago. And without flowers, there'd be no mammals, because before then, it was just green leafy plants on, on the planet. Flowers turned into seeds, fruits, nuts, vegetables, high energy protein, high energy you know, food for mammals to evolve. And then the mammals evolved. So we evolved. The reason why we're here is because of a flower, the invention of the flower. Otherwise, there'd be no people. And then, you know, that brings you to a giant revelation that, well, what do flowers need? Well, they need soil. And where does soil come from? And then bingo, now I'm in the, in the fungal kingdom and doing the deep dive into fungi. And then you go, well, wow, well, fungi makes soil. You know, that seems to be the most basic element of life. Then the scoop of soil, there can be millions of microorganisms. I think one of the things about this pandemic that's interesting for me is that, or maybe the film illuminates in this pandemic, there's 40 trillion bacteria, microbes, and viruses on your body or in your body. You are a giant mega ecosystem. And when you realize that there's this microscopic world, of which you are just one mega ecosystem, then this idea of this coronavirus, I don't think scares you as much. It's not this red ball with spikes that came out of nowhere. We are at the top of the food chain in terms of size on the planet. We're in the 80 percentile in terms of size. Everything else is smaller than us. If you do a deep dive into an atom, that journey is as far as going to the moon. So I love the fact that we can become more aware of microbiology, right? It's all around us. We got to learn. Microbiology is by far the most, I think, exciting field right now in terms of, of healthcare, in terms of scientific exploration, and I think in terms of consciousness. Well, let's forget mm. this arrogant idea, us at the top of the food chain. We're the fucking masters of the universe. Not quite it. And this little tiny pandemic is showing us, man, there's just one of a zillion viruses out there that could potentially, I suppose, do us harm. There's a bunch of them that are good. There's bacteria that's good. There's bacteria that's bad. We got to learn how to navigate in that world, right? And, and be successful in that world and to go to be in flow with it and not to break the immune system of the planet or weaken the immune system of the planet, which I believe has unleashed this pandemic. And in weakening the immune system, it, it's sort of like, you know, our inner world is reflected in our outer world and, and what's mm -hmm. happening in our outer world is reflected in, in our inner world. And I think specifically when we talk about soil, the way that our soil has been neutered yeah. over the past 50 to 60 years and all of the microorganisms and all of the nutrients and everything taken out of it really since the 1930s and, and the Great Dust Bowl when all of that sort of blew away as a result of, you know, massive deforestation efforts. Um, across the United States, and yeah, but but again, it was uh, how ignorant. Even I think the scientists were ignorant of the multitude of microorganisms that were living in the soil, sequestering carbon, you know, breaking down organic matter so it can be recycled as food intake for plants. When you eat, you know, plant food, you're eating the soil. That's where all the nutrients are, and the plants just use photosynthesis, you know, to take light energy and to to create a product that is basically food derived from the soil, which has been broken down by fungi. Thank God, you know? So thank God. Yeah. Fungi. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's really a beautiful thing to look at it in that, from that lens of it, you know, just giant, beautiful cycle. I mean, with all the technology we've done, we have yet to figure out how to take what is the ultimate source that we know of in the universe is energy and the only energy we get is light energy it's light energy that makes the whole thing go around on this planet right mm -hmm. plants are the only ones that know how to convert light energy into chemical bonds called food and we and the fungi are the only ones that depend on eating that food you know plants can live off the sun fungi and animals we need to eat plant in order to survive. It's pretty remarkable. 
the ecosystem of of life. Well, one thing we haven't talked about in the interview yet, and I want to make sure we spend a little bit of time on that, is just your own your own story with psychedelics. As anyone who watched Fantastic Fungi can imagine, there's probably a bit of a backstory there. I know you you sort of the the 60s and 70s were the time of coming of age for you. If you could entertain our listeners with, you know, your sure. own story about psychedelics and growing up in the 60s and the 70s. And obviously, I think it's pretty clear how that inspired all of the work that you've done. But any other sort of tidbits that you'd love to share with us, we, we, we would absolutely love to hear. Yeah. Well, definitely, you know, around 1970, you know, in 69, the bubble was bursting. I was a freshman at UCLA and everything we had learned, you know, you find out isn't true, whether it's democracy or drugs or sex or race relations, all of it was exploding at the same time. And the bubble was bursting everywhere. And so taking a uh, psychedelic journey, which I think I did in my freshman year, was definitely I think one of the most important events in my life, because as reflected in my film career, I'm kind of bored of showing you stuff that's normal, <laughs> that's shot at normal speed. You know, that's why I got into time lapse, slow mo, micro, macro. You know, trying to aerials. You know, just changing up this normal point of view vision. And um, I wanted to share, I guess, what I'd seen in these incredible journeys that you take it you know I, you know bill richards has a great quote in his book it's like you know when you take a psychedelic it's like taking a helicopter ride up to the top of mount everest and then you get a glimpse of what it looks like and then you come back to base camp and then the next day you have to do the trek you got to do the hike and i think it inspired me in so many ways to have a vision to have that kind of aha moment and then to figure out how to make it real and how to share that truth with as many people as possible. So it's kind of interesting now that I think we're going through the same period that we had about 50 years ago. You, you know, Donald Trump is like a replica of Richard Nixon. The idea of repression and divisiveness, it backfired on Richard Nixon. It really created, you know, the, the movement for women, people of color, the environmental movement, Earth Day 1970. All of that is a reaction to repressive government policies. And so I've got a lot of hope, and especially in our younger generation, that they will kind of recharge that idealistic idea that we can make this planet heaven on earth. You know, if we can't change the world, change your community, that was the whole back to the land movement that I was a part of as well. In 19, you know, when I graduated, I went to Mendocino and all these like young PhD hippies from Berkeley, NYU, et cetera, we all migrated to this, you know, back to the land. And guess what? We were clueless, totally clueless on how to live off the land. We didn't know how to have an organic garden. We didn't know how to dig a well. We didn't know how to build a house. We had PhDs and MFAs and we didn't know anything, but we learned and that's what like the whole earth catalog came from. But, but what a benefit today that young people can, you know, take out their phone and Google, you know, composting or chicken ranch or how to grow an onion and instantly get that information. That I think is super cool. And I think this back to the land movement is happening again. I'm proud to say that I was called a hippie back then, but you know, and after 50 years of looking back, we were right. We were totally right on, you know, you know, doing everything organically, having compassion, building your own community. Yeah. Living, living a life you want to live. You know, I think about that all the time. You know, every time hippies have been shown in movies, it's so terrible. You know, like Forrest Gump and they're like these deranged, like, you know, Mick Jagger stereotypes. But, you know, reality is, the folks, you know, during that, you know, revolution it affected a tremendous amount of change. You look at Steve Jobs. You look at, uh, you know, the guys who invented, you know, the, uh, the DNA molecule. I mean, all of these were done on acid trips. So Buckminster Fuller, I think, was know, also well known for, for talking about yeah. LSD and Spaceship Earth and, and all those sorts of things. 
So, you know, it's created a tremendous amount of change. I think we're ready for that again. Um, I love what's happening right now with the, you know, the protests, the reawakening, having the conversation about, you know, systemic racism. It's all, you know, maybe what's really good about this pandemic, and it kind of put everything on pause because we, coming out of this, we need a major reboot. And there was no other force in the world or on the planet that could make everybody stop doing what they were doing, which for the most part was, you know, definitely environmental degradation was a big part of the uh, the mechanism that we were all involved with. So the fact that we could stop for a while, and as we get through this, my heart goes out for the suffering for the people that are marginalized that have taken the worst of it. But coming out of it, we don't want to go back to normal. 50 million young children died last year from starvation. That's not a normal I want to go back to. You know, it doesn't get any publicity. We lost 150,000 people you know, to COVID in this country. 50 million children died from starvation last year. And nobody made a big deal about that. You know, the system's not working. It could be working a lot better. And the path, What's beautiful is that the path is right underneath our feet. It's there. We just got to like wake up and do it. And there is a solution. And I think one of the cool things about the film that I noticed, especially from young people, is that afterwards, you know, they come up to me and they go, oh, God, finally, you know, like a quote unquote environmental film that is solution oriented. Otherwise, I can imagine the tremendous amount of anxiety and depression if I was young now, and all I heard was the science about climate change, about environmental degradation, about loss of species, you know, by 2050, over half the species will be gone. Oh my God, what a bleak future. You know, we definitely need hope. And it, it's really easy to turn it around. Look at what just occurred in the last three or four months. It wasn't great for my movie. You know, although we did pivot, now it's available on, you know, digital, which is great. But um, I was rocking it in the theaters. <laughs> we were about to <laughs> era. You know, we, we had a plan. So this is really cool. So, so as I said earlier, you know, we did, our, did it yourself, self-distributed the movie up until like Christmas. Then we took a pause there because you have all the big, you know, Academy Award contender studio movies that fill up all the theaters. And then we had all these requests from little towns and people all over the world saying, when's Fantastic Fungi going to come to our town or our city or our country? And there was no way we could fulfill all that need, you know, because a lot of them could have been like even churches and schools and you send me a Blu-ray and, and the, the craziness about piracy and how do you manage all that? You can't, you know? So we decided let's do a a one-day event, March 26th, right before Earth Day, we wanted to do uh, everybody go to a theater, and Paul Stamets and I were going to do a live Q&A out of UCLA, and we were going to do the Connect the Mycelial Network Around the Globe. We sold out theaters in London, Paris, Prague, Stockholm, Cape Town, Santiago. We were all going to come together, three time zones, and have a conversation. And we did it. We had 500 theaters booked in North America alone. And just as we're about two weeks out, we're ready to launch. Guess what? We hear about this thing from China, this virus. And we, you know, had to slowly pivot. And we don't control the theaters. But eventually, we just blasted everybody and said, hey, instead of doing the theater thing, we're going to do it online. And we brought the local art house theaters with us and said, if you blast it out to your audience, we will, you know, split the revenue with you guys. So that revenue went back to the local theaters, which in a lot of situations is, is an art house theater, which used that money for food banks to feed the community. I feel good about, like, in the sense of what happened, you know, with COVID. It would have been interesting to have seen how we continue to grow it. We're still going to launch it in Europe and in Japan. It'll be very interesting, fascinating to see what happens in Japan. Well, Japan uh, loves mushrooms, don't they? Yes, but but the psychedelic thing is going to be a whole other story. But they, who knows, right? I mean, well, I'll see them with the, the beauty of the mushrooms and, and how much they love mushrooms, but I don't know if you know how they feel about psychedelics. 
Well, it's interesting. You know, I was with, this was like a few years ago in New York. I was at a, like a, it was like a little bit of a house party. There were maybe 10 or 12 of us. And I was talking with someone there who's a writer for Bloomberg. And he was showing me all this anime from Japan back in the 90s and early 2000s because apparently psychedelic mushrooms used to be legal in Japan before 2004 or something like that. So if you look at if you look at all the anime before that, it's clear that all of these sort of animation studios, those artists were like definitely using mushrooms and the quality of the anime was much much higher and then as soon as they became illegal, it sort of dropped off. So I think like Japan like other spots it right. has probably a pretty strong underground sort of like the artist community is probably really interested in this. It's just that also like the States, the sort of dominant culture is very, you know, conformist. Right. And essentially, you know, around the Japanese are known for the salary men, the people who literally work so hard that they die from working too hard. Mm-hmm. That is a thing in Japan that just dovetails so well into our whole entire story, which is like, the whole point of going back to the land and the whole point of the movement in the 60s and 70s and the same movement that's coming around now and what COVID is exposing to us is shit, we don't need to work this hard, people. Right. right? You don't need to like totally burn yourself out, but that through experiences on psychedelic mushrooms and understanding concepts like not even understanding, but living wonder and awe, we, right. we become creatively inspired to pursue things that are really close to our soul and then it's not like we're wringing our life force out to work soulless jobs that we hate but we find some sense of realignment with ourselves with our spiritual practice with the earth around us so that we can really pursue work that that's mission driven and that's beautiful amen brother i totally agree i mean is there a reason why you know anybody can't grow you know, a bunch of tomatoes on their back porch i mean if you have a tiny <laughs> backyard I mean, there's so, and then, and, you know, besides getting the food, it puts you into the cycle. When I wake up in the morning, first thing I do, I walk outside and I check out what flowers have bloomed, you know, how, how have things grown? Like it orients me in a beautiful way. And I, oh, I got to take care of that. I just need a little water maybe and trim this back. And the flowers are speaking to me. And, you know, that's being in touch with the earth, with life. We got divorced from that. It's not going Instead of that, you go to the supermarket and you get something that's shrink wrapped in plastic that has a, a giant, you know, carbon footprint attached to it because it came from some other place around the world. That tomato could have been from Mexico with pesticides, went on a truck, shipped in, you know, and then wrapped in plastic in a refrigerator. Now I'm going to buy it. I'm going to eat it. And it's not even good for me. Like, wake up, (laughs) like, look at all the, and then I had to go to work (laughs) eight hours, 10 hours to get a paycheck with a fraction of it goes to who knows who, you know, in the military or whatever. And then I get that little paycheck. Then I'm going to go to the store and buy the food so that I can go home and have a life, quote unquote. You'd have more quality time growing your own food. And I think we could all do it, reduce the carbon footprint, get some love, teach your kids how to, where their food comes from, what a gift that is. You know, it doesn't have to be like radical overnight. You know, you grow some food, you grow your own pot, <laughs> you grow your own mushrooms, you know? Exactly. And start with the drugs. That's always the most exciting part, right? Hey, I learned so much from growing pot in Mendocino. We were the first, you know? Right. And everything mm-hmm. I learned from that, you know, obviously goes into um, how I grow food. All my buddies who were the first people to do it have all become like the highest paid vinters at all the wineries now in Sonoma and Mendocino County. There were no wineries up there when I lived there. And now it's like, you know, big business. But the people who know how to navigate the weather, the water, the rain, the temperature, to nurture that plant, to get the greatest flavor out of it, winemaking. It's beautiful art. Same thing with growing pot. The fact that it's a super hot day, is that good or bad? You don't know, right? It's how you navigate it. It's how you nurture it. That kills me. People with wine, they go like, oh, 2010 was a really good year, you know? (laughs) 2014 (laughs) was a bad year, you know? What do you mean? There's like, well, the rain happened a little earlier, a little later. The guy in the field had to navigate. 
When does he harvest? Now? Should he wait? These are all creative decisions. It's so beautiful, right? And it puts you in flow with the weather. And the weather is determined by the moon and the sun. You're like the you know, indigenous cultures that are in totally in tune with the universe. We're such hippies. We sound like such hippies talking about talking about this. And it's so true. And in I fact, know. that recognition, exactly <laughs> what you're talking about, Louis, it's sort of like when I first dropped acid 10 plus years ago, that was like the truth that came through, right? Was that sensitivity to our interconnectedness. And I remember immediately after I, I started doing psychedelics, I started reading Michael Pollan and I read mm-hmm. Omnivore's Dilemma. And I started to understand how, where does our food come from? What is that cycle like? How has industrial farming sort of infiltrated you know, our way of being? Then I watched Food Inc. and started mm-hmm. to get into Joel Salatin and, and some of the stuff that he does in terms of really taking care of the land and regenerative agriculture. And I feel like that, at least from my perspective, where I'm sitting with Third Wave and some of the work that I've specifically done in the psychedelic space, I'm like, that pioneering in a way, like the psychedelic space feels like it's happening. You know, like we're having hundreds of millions of dollars come in and investment. There's a bunch of FDA clinical trials happening. Decrim is happening. Drug policy, especially with all the Black Lives Matter stuff, it's becoming more and more aware that we should just decriminalize all drugs. And so what, you know, we're kind of pinging back and forth on this conversation and probably what we'll both be interested in in the next 10 years is, is like you said, going back to the land. There are so many people who are buying islands off the coast of Canada or land in Costa Rica or old chateaus in the south of France. And we're really asking the question, A, what does it look like to live in community? Mm-hmm. B, when we live in community, what does it look like? to localize and relocalize that energy. So the food that we grow within that community, the way that we nurture those relationships within that community, like it's almost like a mini religion of sorts. What are the values? What are the principles of that community? And then like, how do we embody through that community, this new way of living, this post-industrial way of living that was kicked off in the 60s and 70s at places like the farm in Tennessee or where you were at up in Mendocino County. And now it's sort of like, no, that is the new way of living. We had a taste of it through the 60s and 70s, and now it's finally coming full circle. And that to me is like the exciting part of integrating psychedelics. Psychedelics themselves are great medicines. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about getting high, as we all know. It's once we have that opening of wonder and awe, where do we direct that creative inspiration towards and how do we help not only heal ourselves, but heal our communities and heal our land and mm-hmm. you know, all these other sorts of things? Yeah, I think it's super exciting. I mean, but the pot farmers figured out, you know, in all their little ingenious you know, ways was like how to create the most incredible sensimia, sativa, whatever. That's the same thing you apply to everything that you grow. Nobody got into it on that level before. The crazy passion of being able to do that. And then the books like that Michael Pollan has done and some of the films I've done, he asked this big question, who's controlling whom? Are the plants getting us to like help them reproduce and grow and manifest like crazy by either giving us like healthy food to eat or by helping us have more insight and interconnection, again, with their chemical ability to open up our consciousness, that there's a molecule that fits a receptor in the brain that can give you a spiritual experience. I mean, is that chance? I don't think so. And how do you make it even better? So that energy, I think it's kind of exciting because you can apply that to, to everywhere. Like if you were to get that island in British Columbia, well, that's going to be like a whole unique ecosystem. And, and now I think we have more knowledge to learn how do you grow food in that kind of a climate? Look what the Israelis did. They grow food in the desert. And it's incredible what we can do today. And, and there's, there could be abundance. In theory, if we all went to a plant-based diet, there'd be no starvation. We waste half of all resources trying to you know, grow livestock to create a fraction of energy, food, to feed people. We're definitely you know, doing it the most inefficient way possible. So without being even judgmental, it's inefficient. And nature is all about efficiency. Nature is all about don't waste a single molecule. You know, that's what works. And the most efficient way to get light energy from the sun into your body (laughs) is to eat, you know, a fruit, a vegetable, a nut, a seed, 
not have, feed it to an animal where you get a fraction of a fraction, and then that gets dissected into something that's decaying, and then you eat that thing, and that's supposed to be, you know, the American way of life. It's a joke. But anyways, I don't want to go negative on it. It's a, you, know, you got film, <laughs> food, ink, whatever. I'm just saying the fun part would be, ah, I got this little piece of land. It could be my backyard, you know? What can I do here? How much fun could I have, you know, figuring out, and it's a challenge, what kind of feast of goodies could I grow in my backyard? How much fun would that be? It's a meditation. It takes your mind off of the trivia in life. It takes you off the, your to-do list. It gets you out of psychodrama. It is therapy for the brain, for the mind, for the soul. And the physical part of it is good for your body. Why go to the gym? Why not haul some fucking soil around? <laughs> and don't like that. Trigger, you know, right? Dig a hole, you know? It's like the movement in World War II. Wasn't that a big thing? Everyone started to grow their own food and have a little garden. Yeah. And um, yeah. it's that. It's like we all have a little self reliance in us. We all have a little bit of personal responsibility. And like, where does our food come from? And I think, like you mentioned, now we have the technology to make it easier and more accessible for everyone yeah. to do that. Right. You know, I'm just as guilty as probably a lot of people who are listening to the podcast. There's no reason we should be ordering all our foods from Amazon, you know, or through Whole Foods, but from Amazon. Like, how do we take back that power? How do we take back that energy? You know, yeah. like so many people are like, it is totally absurd how much money Jeff Bezos is now worth. I think it's $190 billion. Right. And like at the end of the day, yeah, we can probably pass more laws around taxation or we can do that or blah, blah, blah. blah. But like at the end of the day, a lot of it is like, how do we just, get that money back by growing our own shit and growing our own food and like all that stuff. It's super important. And like I said, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a 180 degree flip. Tomatoes are the easiest thing in the world to grow. So grow whatever you can. And one of the interesting things, you know, I did a film, God, it's called the city farmstead back in 1975. When the earliest, you know, short films I made, it was in Berkeley. And what they did was they were figuring out how to go to the low income neighborhoods and make them energy efficient the homes, you know, putting in passive solar, growing food on the garden, growing food on the sidewalk, you know, recycling all the waste, including your pee and your poop. And what was really remarkable was that the land in Berkeley, in the flats, you know, in the part of the low income neighborhood, is the best soil. That was the delta. You know, all the cities are sitting on the best soil because that's where people first, right? They moved in. That's where they lived because it was the place that was the most, you know, verdant community to grow food and have water. And we covered it with concrete. So city gardens, by far, underneath all that is soil that's been rich for thousands of years. It's the best farmland around. So that's just another example, again, of how being a built community in the inner city, in these like food deserts, literally they have the best soil in the area. Hidden little diamond gems, right? Right below our totally. feet that we, that well, we don't I mean, even know of. Well, if, if you turn a clock back 100, 200 years, we, if you're living in LA or whatever, it's like, where would you have settled as a settler? Along the river, there would have been a nice little meadow where things grow really beautifully. <laughs> that became the center of the city, right? So mm -hmm. it was the best farmland. And then we... Yeah, you know, eventually it grew. So um, anyways, I think the whole goal is just to live in harmony with nature. One little tiny story I do want to share with your crowd you know, regarding you know how we released the film and the decrim movement. We opened the film in Denver for obvious reasons. Denver was the first city to pass the initiative on decriminalizing um, you know psilocybin and mushrooms. And so we go there and obviously we sell out the crowd. You know, we broke records, by the way, in the theater in Denver. But one of the beautiful things I learned was when we were, you know, doing the Q&A, we had the leaders from SPOR, which is the uh, political movement that got it on the ballot, they got it passed. They got more votes than the mayor did <laughs> in the election. And then after the election, the mayor and chief of police and all these, you know, bureaucrats who were against it, we're freaking out going, oh, well, now what do we do? What, what if somebody's on a bad trip? You know, what do we do? How do you deal with that? So they had a meeting 
with all the heads of all the different departments of city government, because they all were freaking out. I think there was only one arrest in six years of anyway, so somebody having a bad trip, quote unquote. And um, when they got together with all the leaders, what happened was they turned the conversation to what do we do to help the, you know, the people that are marginalized in our community? What about the people that are homeless? What about the people with mental disorders? What about all the people that are sleeping on the streets? You know, what about the people that are hungry? What about the people that, that have addiction, you know, to alcohol, tobacco? How do we treat all these people? And the reality was none of these people had ever gotten together to have the conversation. So the decriminalized movement spurred, it created the mycelial network for all these different social services, police, mayor, you know, to get together and have a conversation about it. Pretty remarkable. And that, huh? and that absolutely. And, and that I think was the beautiful part about what you did with the fantastic fungi, getting back to the beginning of the conversation. It's, it was that community focus yeah. of let's host this in local theaters. Let's do local promotion. Yeah. And like you were even saying with the example of what happened with COVID, let's keep that energy in that container. Because that energy recycling that is what keeps communities vibrant. You know, so that's such a great specific example of how that can then be applied to shift things on a much larger scale for psilocybin decriminalization and drug policy and you know, all of these things that are so critical at this point in time. Yep. And I would tell the audience right before the film, I go, Hey, thank you guys for all showing up. Thank you to the mycelial network for making it happen. And everybody cheers. I don't have to explain what mycelial network means. You know, exactly. we spent no money on advertising and marketing and they all showed up. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I've, trust me, after all the years I've been in film, the difficulty of getting, they call it butts and seats, is really hard. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and we got the mycelial network put butts and seats and I would just kind of like, you know, cruise in. I mean, look, again, a lot of work to make the elements, the trailers, the movie, get it out there, get the theaters guy, the book, it, and a lot of work. But we didn't have to like do the game of Hollywood, you know, with advertising marketing of like adrenaline pushing, fear inducing, anxiety driven ads and trailers and marketing to get people to show up. None of that. You know, we just put the word out through the network. And you speak to the soul. Yeah. When the soul hears it, it'll come, you know? Yeah, I think that's that's the power of these mushrooms. Yeah, and then you know, who knows how big the underground movement is? Because like I didn't know about it at all, to be honest. Right. From my early you know seventies to maybe ten years ago, you know, I was raising kids and you know running a company and doing all kinds of things and had not participated at all. I didn't know there was an underground movement of therapists who were still treating people with psilocybin or LSD. I didn't know about these sacred circles that are going on. We may never know because it, people still don't talk about it as of this moment, right? It's still secret. It's a bit mysterious, which is yeah. sort of the point, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's pretty amazing. And we still, with friends, it's kind of weird. We still talk in code a little bit. Yeah. You know, on the telephone. Like, what's up with that? Yet, but I, I go down Ventura Boulevard and every street corner, there's like a mega billboard for like a, a cannabis store. And yet every time a cop pulls up behind me, I'm always looking around to make sure there's nothing on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, wait a minute. What, what happened? Louis traumatized <laughs> from 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it, yeah. So things are changing quickly, which is great. Yeah. You know, things are really changing quickly, but it's pretty remarkable. It is. And, and mushrooms can help us adapt. And that's not even something we got into in this conversation. But like we had started initially talking about resilience. Yeah. And I think that's another beautiful part about mushrooms, helping with adaptability, helping with resilience, helping us to understand. Like, I feel I think there are a lot of people right now who feel hopeless, Louie, who feel like we're at this existential crisis and things are going south very, very fast. And I think one of the things that mushrooms, wonder, awe, all these things is they inspire hope. And more than anything right now, people, I think, need hope. That's why I'm such an optimist when it comes to, to psychedelic medicine, yeah. to your work, but just mushrooms in general is I think they are something that provide tremendous hope for adapting and evolving 
into whatever it is that we're we're becoming. Yeah, because it's nature's way. It's nature's operating instructions. I don't care if it's yep. a little piece of grass growing in a crack in the sidewalk. That gives me hope, as well as a yep. field of flowers, as well as a you know a field of tomatoes. I mean, I look at that and go, man, you're fucking unstoppable. You know, it's like <laughs> we're gonna whatever happens happens, but you've got an agenda that's righteous. You're taking light energy, turning it into chemical energy, into food. Amen. I love you. Dude, keep doing what you're doing. And how can I help you? You know, and that's the hope because there's already an engine, an energy that is happening. We've kind of like, you know, jumped off this carousel. We got to jump back on because it's perpetual energy. It's really perpetual energy because life created reproduction as a way to overcome entropy. Everything in the world will break down. You think about the beauty of, of reproduction that you can just like, you know, make another version of it that's better potentially. And it just keeps going on and on and on into infinity. For all we know, life's a force of energy. And we just want to be a part of that, honor it and learn from it and then get on that bandwagon. It's so easy. It is. Well, Louis, thank you for for joining us on the podcast. Before we put a full wrap on it, yeah, if listeners just kind of if we just a little more details on fantastic fungi where they can find it the next project that you have including you know the podcast and you know anything else that you think would be relevant for our audience as we wrap up definitely go to fantasticfungi.com because that will have you know updates of everything we're doing in terms of you know the release of it on apple tv and on our website etc so fantasticfungi.com also movingart.com It'll be information about Wonder and Awe, the series we're going to do, as well as on Netflix, I do have a series called Moving Art that's just music and visuals that take you on a journey without spoken words so that you can hear your own inner voice. I highly recommend that. And um, those would be the two uh, great resources to check into and to um, love, appreciate life, Soak up the beauty because beauty is nature's tool for survival. We protect what we fall in love with. Wow. That's a great way to end. Well, thank you, Louis Schwartzberg, director of Fantastic Fungi and many other incredible short films. It was an honor to, to sit with you and dive deep into the mycelial network. Honor to be with you. Keep up the great work at the third wave. It's so important. Um, you're a beacon of light and um, we all really are grateful and appreciate the work you do, Paul. Paul.